Part 2 concludes our overview by looking at a model for the observation data and its fusion with the system model, starting with the observation model. For example, in this instance, we might have borrowed a particularly old and noisy police speed camera to record the car deceleration. In fact, any sensor we might choose won't be perfect, it'll introduce some noise, but in our case the results might look like this. Now, these noisy signals can be modelled as a random process, but random processes can get a bit messy, so it's absolutely convenient to assume a simpler model as possible to generate the sort of effects we see. The best choice from the range of statistical distributions is the bell-shaped Gaussian or normal distribution, in which small errors around zero are more likely than large ones, say above four in this case. Here, for example, the probability of x having a value between 1 and 2 corresponds to the shaded area under the bell graph, a value of 0.136, or 136 of the total 1,000 sample values shown. This distribution happens naturally in many situations, particularly if the signal in question results from a combination of noise sources such as electronic noise, interference, ambient effects, and so on. It's characterized by its average value, and it's spread around the average. However, in the interest of simplicity, we can assume that the noise is equally spread around zero, so that all we need to represent is its size. But this, however, is a bit tricky. We can't use the signal itself as it's random, and because it's centered around zero, taking an average won't help because the positive and negative values will tend to cancel out, leaving zero. However, if we square every value, the result will always be positive. And now we can simply take the average of the squares to give a measure of the size of the noise signal. This is its mean squared value, or variance, with a value of 1 in this case. In addition to size, we also need to consider the frequency range of the noise signals. It's again absolutely convenient to assume it contains an equal amount of all frequencies, so-called white noise, heard as the shh sound in loudspeakers. We don't see the higher frequencies in our car graph, though, because we're sampling the signal only once every second. Owing to the square in the definition, a signal with a variance of 10 is the square root of 10, or 3.16 times bigger, than a signal with a variance of 1. So our final observation model is that of a Gaussian zero-mean white noise, represented simply by its variance as an indication of how much noise there is. The noise in the speed graph above has a variance of 1 miles per hour squared, for instance. The final thing we need to consider in our models is that other factors influence the motion itself. For example, gusts of wind or undulations in the road surface, or adjustments the driver makes to the car controls. We can represent these unknown effects as disturbances to the motion, V, and represent them as a best guess by a similar Gaussian noise model to the one used for measurement noise. So, we finally wind up with the model shown in the slide. The inputs to the system, captured at some sample time k, are the known drive input, uk, and the unknown disturbances, VK. Internally, the model then predicts the next system state at time XK plus 1 from the current state, XK. The system output, the combination of the internal states we're observing, is however subject to measurement noise, WK, resulting in the final noisy measured output, YK. Having got a model for our system, let's see how we can use it to predict what's happening. With a good model of our aircraft, say, we could simply apply the known system inputs to it and it should track the behaviour of the physical system both in its overall output response and in its internal states. But snags arise. One is that there will inevitably be some error in even the best model which will cause it to diverge from the real system over time. The other snag is that in order for the model to track the system, it must be started off at the same place but we don't generally know the initial conditions the system starts from. And finally, the pilot or the weather may apply disturbances to the motion we don't know about. This means that the basic plan won't work very well. But the thing to notice is that the model will predict the system output, the estimated aircraft position, as well as its internal states, and we do have some access to the system output via our noisy observations. So the issue here is how to get the model to track the actual flight path, correcting for any errors, and somehow locking in to the proper path no matter where the model starts from. The solution is to use feedback. A feedback system will automatically adjust itself to drive its output to reduce the error signal. 
If the model is predicting the wrong output, there will be an error between the observed value for the system, assuming for a moment that this is an accurate measurement, and the model prediction. This error is fed back to the system model, so that if the model is low in its prediction, the error pushes it up a bit, and if it's high in its prediction, the error pushes it down a bit, until the output of the model lines up with the observation. This is the structure of the state observer. The feedback signal drives the model along with the input. We can tune the response of the observer by inserting a gain element in the feedback loop. This gain value determines the effect the error has on the model. With a high value of gain, the model will lock in tightly to the observations of the real system. With a lower value of gain, the model will still try to follow the observations, but not quite so enthusiastically. And with zero gain, the output will simply be the model prediction. Because our observations aren't accurate, we want to use the best gain, indicated by the little star, to merge the two sources of data, the model predictions and the measured observation. This slide shows the structure of the Kalman filter in its discrete predictor-corrector form. The prediction part consists simply of our dynamic model, which predicts the next state of the system based on the last state, and also predicts its output. The notation shows these predictions with pointy hats to indicate their model estimates. There's also a unit delay block which steps back our model prediction one sample, so that it uses the previous input uk-1 to estimate the current state xk and output yk. The notation shows this with a vertical bar separating the sample time and the data on which the estimate is based. So xk-1 bar k means that this is an estimate of x at sample time k based on data up to sample time k-1. The trick to stepping back one sample is that the predicted output estimate can be directly compared now with the actual observation yk. The correction part takes the error between the current observation and the predicted output and uses it to correct all of the state estimates to obtain the best estimate of the system state xk based now on all the observation data up to time k. The mix of prediction and correction is determined by the magic Kalman gain factor, big K star, big in the 50s that is. This gain determines the extent to which the filter follows the model or the measurement. The overall result is the best guess of the plane position obtained by combining these two different sources of information. If the measurements of the plane position are known to be accurate, then the gain should be high and the observations should dominate the filter response. If, on the other hand, the observations are known to be noisy, then the gain should be lower and the filter should take more notice of the prediction given by the model. In our original scenario, when the plane flies into the cloud, we'd have to rely on the model alone. The Kalman gain is a balance between the uncertainty of the model prediction, determined by the size or variance of the disturbance noise, and the uncertainty associated with the observation as described by the variance of the observation noise. Our model prediction could be influenced by factors such as a jet airliner is unlikely to make rapid turns within the cloud, unless the pilot spills coffee in his lap, whereas a stunt plane might well do so. The observation noise could be influenced by factors such as the thickness of the cloud or instrument GPS or radar errors if these are used. If we know these relative uncertainties, we can fix the gain to get the best or optimal estimate of the true position. But notice that the filter in this form is not as adaptive as we are to different sorts of cloudiness. Well, that's how it works. How does it perform? This slide shows the results for a common filter estimating the position and velocity of a simple dynamic system subject to disturbance and observation noise. In this case, the observation noise is known to have a variance 10 times greater than the disturbance noise. In this simulation, I've cheated a bit to show the actual position and velocity signals that the filter is estimating. The yellow trace shows the position observation, the noisy data input to the filter. The green trace shows the filter's output estimate of the position, following the measurement but filtering out just about all of the high frequency noise to give an estimate much closer to the actual violet trace. This slide summarizes the main points in this rather sketchy overview of the Kalman filter an important component of many current localization and navigation devices, and an example of how a smart algorithm may be implemented at low cost using modern electronics to greatly improve the performance of commercial, military, and industrial devices. The next video deals in more detail with noisy or stochastic process models.